Welcome. I'm glad everyone could make it today. Um, I, uh, I'm excited for today. I think we're going to have a very interesting dis discussion with, uh, with Richard here. And uh, we've got an excellent array of work that we're going to look at. Um, before we get to work, we're going to spend a few moments just uh, chatting a little bit about um, how uh, you got into the industry and sort of your career so far. And then we'll take a look at some work. And then we will open it up to uh, about 20 minutes, half an hour of uh, Q&A. So while you're sitting here, please do think of questions because we would like to have a really good conversation uh, going near the end of this. Um, so I understand this is your first time in Toronto, is that correct? It is, and what a lovely city it is too, and very welcoming. <coughs> yeah, everybody's been really great. I mean, it's been um, quite hard work, what with the uh, design show, plus me trying to work at night as well. So you can imagine it's been a bit full on you mean work doesn't stop no it, it <laughs> so doesn't stop no no it's still relentless. waiting for someone to invent a pause button for that yeah um well why don't we before we get uh into the present why don't we start mm -hmm. a little bit about uh how you got into title designs um your first uh piece of work was quadrophenia which is a really seminal and very famous piece of work um can you tell me a little bit about how that project came to be and what you were doing at that time yeah sure it's um you know, when I kind of roll the tape back and think about that now, you've got to remember that that was a, a whole different era where everything was analog, if you can all remember analog. So if you are below 30 years of age, you're um, a digital native, as where I'm a digital immigrant. So um, being all analog, you know, everything was lick and stick and through optical printers and all the rest of it. So um, I was at a um, a lucky break when I was very young. I, I kind of got into the industry when I was about 15 and uh, lucky enough to get a job in an art department that was um, making film trailers. And then uh, I noticed come up at uh, Pinewood that this film Quadrophenia was about to start and I read the, um, the sort of synopsis of what it was about and lo and behold it was about mods and at that time I was a mod and luckily I had a scooter and I thought, I'll chance my arm and go up to Pinewood Studios and see if I could uh, possibly bump into Frank Rodham, who was uh, the uh, director. And, you know, as chance would have it, I did. I literally bumped into him. And uh, I was quite brave and quite stupid and just started chatting and saying how much, you know, the mod era meant to me and all the rest of it, you know, especially as I was born in um, around Soho. So I did, I was genuine, I wasn't a fake. <laughs> Um, so Frank actually quite liked me and um, <clears throat> he said, uh, you know, what kind of stuff was I doing? And I explained to him that it's the trailer company and he knew the trailer company that I was working with. And uh, I said, look, I'd really like to have a go at maybe doing the, the titles. What do you think about that? So he said, yeah, sure, come on, let's have a go. And that was it. I got the job. Um, it was so easy, but it sounds easy now, but you know, I was absolutely terrified at the time. I thought this is really quite ridiculous. So I literally walked into it. Um, and at the same time, um, I was very fortunate to meet uh, Morris Binder, who did the early Bond titles. And uh, Morris would come up to the trailer company to shoot various effects and bits of messing around. And I got under his skin as well. And that proved really beneficial. Um, because without him, I don't think I'd have got the start that I got because he just taught me so many different things. Um, so he was like a mentor, really. And that was it. There's a couple of interesting things in there. You, you alluded to how things have changed, which mm. I'd like to get to in, to in a minute, but also this idea of bumping into Frank. And mm -hmm. obviously, in hindsight, it's great to be riding up on a scooter and, oh, yeah. hey, dude, how's it going? Yeah. But um, it probably wasn't quite that easy. Mm. Yet, the relationship with a director is, is paramount for this business, is it not? Yeah, well, that, that's something I kind of learned, you know, quite early on. It's, um, I think we were explaining backstage that what I find with directors is that, uh, well, I'm one myself, but it's, it's that one-to-one -one thing. You know, if you kind of meet them with a little gang, they're, they're slightly terrified. But if, you're, if you can just get to them one-to-one, -one, that, that has always really worked for me. It's a, I don't know, some sort of synergy creative thing that kind of goes on. They're like myself, I think I've met and discussed this in depth with a lot of directors and creative people. In a way, we're quite insecure, but it's our insecurity that makes us what we are. 
it's very kind of paradoxical. Do you think that, given that most communication is electronic now, there's yeah. email and whatnot, um, does it make making getting that personal connection with a director more difficult? Um, I think it's it's about the same. I think Skype is brilliant. So we do quite a lot of Skype um, conversations. You know, with the new technology, Skype has been one thing I've found invaluable because having to travel around a lot, as I do now, the Skype thing actually does almost make you feel as though you're in the same room. You know, so if I'm working with other specialists or I've got to do a conference call, I actually won't do it on a telephone. I will actually get a Skype number and Skype them. L looking at people, even though it's, you know, through hyperspace, is actually does work. And I don't even know why it works, it just does. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So you can all use Skype, you know, it's a good way to communicate. Um, tell me how the industry has changed. You, you mentioned that the event that you were at uh, yesterday yeah. was talking about how technology has evolved the yeah. industry and you alluded to that now. What's kind of happened in the world of title design in the last 10, 20 years or uh, since you've been involved? Since I've been doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just trying to marry that change together. I mean, I remember way back in, I think it was uh, somewhere in the 80s, we bought a Quantel paint box. And when we had that, uh, I just thought, whoa, I can actually see, I've got an idea what's going to come after this. That This is kind of like the beginning of the end, really, of, of analog versus digital. And it so was. Um, and it's, it kind of it rattled quite a lot of people of my generation. But I just thought, well, it's, these are just tools. You just use them as tools. You know, sometimes it's great to, you know, to go back and shoot on... 16 mil and if you've got a decent budget shoot on 35 so now we shoot on a red camera you know sometimes i'll use any other piece of equipment that i need because i think at the end of the day all of this stuff is just is stuff what 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 you have to get to for me is i'm an ideas person so as long as i can keep feeding ideas the technology doesn't really matter because that's a different stage of a of a piece you know so like you know, I don't see a piece of 35 mil neg anymore. Well, so what? You know, I see a DI sit in a DI suite and grade it. It's just how it is, and you just have to adapt to those things. When you work with people who are just starting out, do you see the technology getting in the way of ideas? Um, in film, no, not really, because you see, we still we still start with um, a film script. So there's a project I'm just starting in London now called uh, Welcome to the Punch. And it's a new director, although he did a very successful film a couple of years ago, which I mentioned to you, called Shifty. Um, Aaron, a really nice, really bright guy. And, um, you know, we, we're still meeting, chatting together. He gives me the script, I read the script. Well, that hasn't changed since the days when I worked with Frank Rodham. So the, the basic tenure of how we start definitely has not changed. So I will read a script if they've shot material, uh, which they normally have by the, by the stage they give me a shout. Um, I'll look at um, a rough cut. So instead of looking at it on a steam Beck, I now look at it on an Avid. So nothing's changed there. So that's the same. Um, when I come up with the ideas, um, I don't work on a, uh, on a written brief. So unlike branding jobs I do or jobs for advertising agencies and TV companies, they're all kind of brief-led. Um, the only brief is the script and my interaction. So with that in mind, I will then just go away into my world of what I think I can take bits from and then start to piece together what could be, you know, a really nice three-minute opener and then draw it out. So we still do pencil storyboards. And in film, as I'm sure you know, you probably all know, you know, animation is really strong at the moment. Um, illustrators, uh, sculptors, all those specialist people still operate in the same way in the film industry. Technology does not get in the way of that. You know, to be a great illustrator is an amazing art and that is still there you know, as the books and information, you know, will show you. 
Can you talk to me a bit about your creative process? Um, do you have a creative process? Do you have one that you identify? What happens when you first get a job? What do you do? do you um, yeah, what do I do? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, it's the same for any project, even my own personal projects. It's the same process that I go through. Um, I totally work alone and I always go outside. I will never sit indoors, especially looking at a Mac. I will never do that. <coughs> I, I will probably pick out a few books maybe, but I basically get the ideas by not having ideas. It's a very paradoxical process. So I'll probably just go around to, you know, local cafe bar Italia, or I'll go into a park, or I'll just be um, immersed in outside. Outside is about the only way I can describe it. Is that a really creative way of saying procrastinating? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit like that. I, I just I don't, do that. I just call yeah. it procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's very hard to to explain to somebody else because it's only very personal to me. But it's the um, I just forget about the project. I don't try and analyse what I've read or what I've um, come into contact with. So for instance, um, let me give you some idea of that. Um, okay, me meeting um, Tim Burton for the first time was on the Batman film, the first Batman, um, and that was shot at Pima Studios. And again, it was a chance idea, um, although I'd built up by then you know, a certain amount of reputation. Somebody said to me, oh, well, you, you, you have got a shot at this, go and meet Tim. So I went straight up and met Tim. Um, and he wasn't really giving away too much about what he wanted. So I was kind of left a bit, mm, okay. Nothing was shot, so it was while they were still building the set. I left him after, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, very short meeting. And I simply walked around to where um, the set was being built. And I just thought, there's got to be some kind of answer maybe in the set. And I looked at how Gotham City was being put together in that very gothic style. And then simply got in my car, drove back into London, and I had the idea within about 20 minutes. And I just thought, I know what it is. It's, it's the graphic cartoon known trademark turned into a landscape three-dimensional space because the shapes of Gotham City and the set were all sharp edged and it's just seeing the sharp edges just got me straight to the classic comic Batman logo so it literally came in a flash and with that <coughs> I all I did is I simply drew out probably about eight frames that's all pencil frames one mood board. The two days later, I took it straight back to Tim. He said yes straight away. So it can happen like that, without really analysing the thing too deeply. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of pencil drawing is interesting as well. I've um, I've heard you say before that uh, you you don't present to directors high end visuals. No. Why is that? Because I always think that an idea can be. As long as the idea comes across, so they can see a tree as a tree, um, it doesn't matter what fruit or leaves you put on that tree, they, they get the idea of what it is. Um, and that allows them to, if they'd like to, they can then put things onto that image. So it allows for growth, it allows for a visual communication to then make that idea come to something really really good I think if um, and I've tried it out the other way if you go very high end well this is me personally if I go very high end I think it starts to hide the core idea and it's the core idea that has to be built on not the other way around and especially now with um, you know CGI and all the rest of it and the things that we can actually do it's much better that you see the skeleton of something because then it does allow for it to, to manifest. Manifest, that's the word. Yeah? And you're not taking away, you're just adding on. You're adding on, yeah. And the core idea will always hold true. You know, you mentioned filling the three minutes that this, this role kind of is the, it's the first thing mm. that people see when they, when they sit into a theater and the lights go down and here come the titles. Um, historically, when you look at titles, they were very typography led. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of the work now, and certainly a lot of your work going for back quite a few years, is much more narrative. Even hearing you talk about mm -hmm. Batman, and, and when we get to Sweeney Todd as well, which is incredibly narrative. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that's been a, a trend in the industry? Do you think that, what, what sort of uh, role does uh, a narrative in that first impactful moment play? Um, well, again, it, it, it's really coming from the script. All scripts, as we all know, are all completely different. So I, I've got to look at them on face value and see, firstly, is there a narrative there? A lot of the time there isn't. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's been a bit of a fashion thing, I think. There's a little spate of time where uh, producers only wanted to put up the main title and have everything else on the end. So you've got to kind of go with the change, the people. There's quite a lot of factors in there that will determine its, its outcome. Um, I think the first piece you're going to see today um, is not going to be released until April. And they had in their mind that they only wanted to have one simple title and they wanted it, I don't know, somewhere like two minutes in. As soon as I looked at the rough cut, um, my thought was, no, don't do that. Let's link your brand logo to what I come up with, which will then link into your first shot of live action. That will make much more sense. Um, and that's just experience that told me that. And I did that, and the producers went, whoa, yeah, God, you were so right. But that's just coming from experience and knowing knowing how how to open something a bit like a book jacket mm -hmm. you know some people can do a really great book jacket that takes you in to want to read those pages and others don't it's you know it's that kind of thing um well, you know when you go back in time if you look at you know the great master like Saul Bass he came from a graphic background very similar to me and he was very used to working in two dimensional space but where he was very clever is he understood, uh, hopefully what I understand, is how you can take that little synergy from a film and then turn it into a visual graphic something. You know, Psycho is a great example. Well, they're all great examples, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, you know, which I'm sure you all know. Well, let's use this as a segue to get into the work because you started talking about your uh, the film that's coming out uh, in April. It's called Cold Light of Day. Um, can we roll that clip? Okay, just explain that. <clears throat> so, yeah, you've got the front there and you've got the end sequence. So you've got to imagine the bit in the middle. Oh. <laughs> um, and also the, the, the whole idea, again, it's very difficult when you show things out of context, but the whole idea of the, the line idea is that the whole film is all about miscommunication. It's all about um, a guy that falls into something and then he has to then find the line of communication to get himself through it. So if you just re recall the opening there, so as soon as we, as soon as I married the plane up and we touched down, the film then goes into an interior shot and away we go. But what I wanted to show you there is how simply something can be done, but nobody could see the simplicity. So all the people on the production could not get that. <clears throat> they thought it was just a straightforward super title over a long shot two minutes further on. But I think that opening would actually, although it's very short, would actually grab the attention of the viewer straight away. They think, oh, hang on, I need to start taking in information. It's, so very, it's very similar, actually, to what you did with High Fidelity as well, where it's yeah, a very it's short a clip. Similar idea, yeah. And then right in, yeah, right and then in. a lot yeah. of the sort of element is at the end with yeah. the out titles. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you do work like this in terms of process, do you, um, with the, the, the logo, of the type. Mm -hmm. Is that supplied to you? Is that something that you come up with? No, no, it's uh, always we'll come up with our own lo logo um, ident for it. At what point in the process are you generally brought in by directors? Um, again, it varies. If it's somebody I know, <clears throat> they'll probably let me have the script about halfway through their shooting or maybe before. I mean, it does vary. Um, this is a particularly new client and uh, they came to me by recommendation. They'd already shot everything in Spain, and then they um, th they were just coming back through London before going back to LA, and they just said, "Oh, is there a chance we could meet up and have a chat about it?" So you know, 
as usual, I'd jump straight into it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, we can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, that's what we, it's yeah. our fuel, right? That's our fuel, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's go on to the next one. The next one is uh, Tamara Drew, which uh -huh. was done in 2010, uh, directed by Stephen Frears, with whom you've worked on a couple of occasions, uh, High Fidelity being one. Mm -hmm. And also you've mentioned that you've got a new film with him, Lay the Favourite, is that correct? Yeah, Lay the Favourite, which we're shooting uh, model sections for that next week. Okay. Um, um, well, why don't we play this clip and then we'll yeah. talk a little I've bit I've done about it. three films for him, I think, in all. Okay. Yeah. As you can see, completely different. This, now, this <laughs> film's this film's about like a love quadrangle or a love polygon, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it, uh, you, it comes from. Uh, you have to be quite English, I think, to understand this. <laughs> this comes from um, a series of uh, cartoon strips from Posey Simmons, um, from the Guardian, but it's quite quirky. It's very English. But. And what was the idea here? Again, it's very. It seems like it's very integrated into the film that was already shot, and you've kind of quickly get into it um yeah on, on, on something like this um especially working with Stephen, who's in some ways quite a complex character to work with he will he will try lots of different things and one of the things that i'm very fortunate to work with him is that he will let me try different things and then i just keep offering them up until he likes one <laughs> it's kind of he loves the, you he loves How me basically yeah he, he just can't bear for me to be away from him for too long <laughs> So I think we tried about six different openings for the film. Uh, the only thing that really stuck was the, um, was the ad and the little animation linking into the house. Everything before that, we were constantly changing. And um, he's great because he does actually give me quite a free reign. And he's very um, editorially driven. So it's all about the narrative. It's all about his characters and his ideas. And I think he does take a long time in his process to actually you know, settle for something. The the current one we're working on, which is completely different, it's about um, gambling in Las Vegas. And uh, again, it's the same process I'm going through. I'm trying lots of different things. So um, the editor that he always works with is um, a very highly recognized editor called Mick Audsley. And it's basically me and Mick left with it all, which means recutting, trying things. It's just a, an ongoing process. I wouldn't say it's totally a full-on creative process. It's much more of um, an editorial way of working, of which then the graphics then become what they become. So on Tamara Drew, you may think, why is that Tamara Drew logo going diagonally across the screen? Well, I, I fought and fought for Steve not to have that. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, Steve said, no, Richard, look, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be really good. It's really quite funny. I like it. I said, Stephen, it looks ghastly like that. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, no, we'll put a sound effect over it. He said, no, you really will like it, Richard. I said, OK. In the end, you just sort of give up, you know. <laughs> and there it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, you have to take the humour with a lot of this stuff. That's the occupational hazard of working with big personality yeah, directors. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> In instances like that, where you're where you're uh, placing the design over um, footage from the film, is it always footage that's already existing, or do you ever have the opportunity to use the actors to create new oh, yeah. content? Uh, yeah, that can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Stephen, even um, I think it was on Dirty Pretty Things. Um, I remember this. We shot this. a sort of slightly sort of um, when was that? eight or nine years ago, Dirty Pretty Things. I don't know if it came over here. Anyway, so it's about um, transplanting body parts. Anyway, so um, he got stuck with that, and he said, oh, Richard, I don't know what to do for this, this opening. Well, why don't you shoot something? Go and shoot something. So I said, all right, Steve, we'll go and shoot something. He said, well, I'm going to be down in the tunnels down in the East End. Why don't you go down there, get my second unit camera. I'll give you 2,000-foot reel. Just go down there and see if you can find something that we can get an opening with. So I went down there, sorted all that out, um, got into somebody's apartment block so I could get up high, shot some shots, and it actually worked. And, um, you know, it is the front of the film. So, again, it, it's, it's very much... Um, um, you just have to kind of be on the spur of the moment with these people. You know, they can, they can throw you in the deep end one minute and then pull you out the next. And it, it is very... It's kind of quite slight rock and roll, you know. You can't... <laughs> You couldn't, you couldn't write it, really. I mean, is it, 
they're just things that happen in a day, you know, and hopefully it ends up on there. Speaking of rock and roll, I mean, Tim Burton is oh, yeah. completely one of the masters. We yeah. can totally rock and roll in this yeah. industry. Um, the next clip is Sweeney Todd. I'm, mm -hmm. Do you want to play it first and then speak about it? Uh, yeah, can do. Yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, but yeah. let's play that, play please. That. So this, talking about completely different, a bit of a theme we have here today, is completely different from the others. Um, mm -hmm. It's also the second time you worked with Tim Burton. Um, can you tell me about this? It's incredibly narrative and... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, it's, um, I think it's down to connections, really. Uh, Tim and I definitely connected on the first Batman film, and then he was in Los Angeles for a period, quite a period of time, and I didn't see him much. And then um, when this came up, and he's back in London. Um, I was just fortunate again. He just gave me a call and said, I've got something here. Went up and saw Tim again. He's very laid back. He's very calm um, personality. And said, oh, Rich, just go and have a look at the rough cut with Chris and just see if you've got any ideas. So um, we came up with um, what I did on this. I, I involved some other friends of mine because I thought it'd be quite interesting um, as a little collective to see how many little ideas we could generate. So about three or four of us generated lots of ideas. I think I ended up, ended up with about 10 ideas. Because Tim said that, that he wasn't interested in pitching. He said, I, I, I want you to do this, Richard. So, you know, just go for it. So I thought it'd be quite nice just to see what other ideas there could be, just in case I miss something. And um, what I did is I, again, I, I, I kind of understood the film from a narrative point of view, and I just thought it would be a nice idea if this is just about in, inside Sweeney Todd's head, this idea about what he's gonna do when he gets back to London after being incarcerated and banished. So with that, I just thought, oh, I know, let's, let's use blood as the metaphor, and let's start it in the sky and take it all the way down into the sewer. And I think the other thing that um, other people have said to me about my work, especially directors, is they say, what you're also very good at, Richard, is you, you, your seamless join between their first frame of live action and what I do. And I think that shows it as well, it's seamless. <clears throat> and I strive for that all the time because, again, you know, I, I like it to feel as though it's one piece. It's not, you know, it's not separate from a film, unlike TV shows, which, you know, there's a sequence, then there's the show. I always like them to be seamless. Anyway, so, um, I literally scribbled out the narrative on about four sheets of A4. Um, I did put some quite high-end mood boards together. Um, my other designer friends came up with some quite interesting ideas, none of which could be kicked out at that stage. And uh, I just took the whole bunch back to Tim, and Tim being Tim, said, oh, this is great, Rich, what you got in that box? So I said, oh, I, I thought we'd do loads of ideas for you, Tim, so we have something to discuss. So with that, he just picks up the box and just tips it on the floor. So we end up on the carpet with all these ideas all spread out everywhere. And literally in a second, he spotted the, the A4 sheets of paper and he could see the narrative that I'd sketched out really roughly. So I bet that's you. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so he looked at that and then put it to one side. And then we went through some of the other boards. And what came out of the other boards, which is I'm glad I did that process, is um, another good friend of mine who's very um, photographic in his work. He had that, he had a color template, um, which was actually spot on. He, he, he got some colors on sort of photo repage style, which is still in there now. So the whole color palette um, was down to him coming up with that color scheme. So all Tim did is he grabbed the color scheme, grabbed the narrative, and he said, well, that's it then. That, that's what I'd like you to go and make. So with that, we went straight into production. And the production is interesting too, because from what I understand, is it's an element of live action and animation as well. Yeah, we've got live action, 3D, uh, photo montage, and a bit of stop frame in there as well. So yeah, it's quite quite a lot to do. Um, and that that's then, as my role as the director, to then pick the specialists that are going to do the certain sections that understand the vision and then keep, keep control of it, you know? Um, the, the simplest thing I thought was, oh, the meat grinder section. Oh, that's easy. We just get the meat grinder and we, sh we shoot the, um, the mints coming out. 
No, that was the hardest bit to do. Because when you shove it in, the mince comes out and then drops off. So that didn't work. So we then had to get an animator who was extremely skilled and really patient, sat for over a week doing every frame of, the, of that animation of the meat. I'm sure he like, loves Whoa. you. <laughs> he so didn't love me after that. And is vegetarian <laughs> now. <laughs> so, you know, these jobs are always unique. They're always one off. You never know what's going to happen. So if there's, if there's a disaster, you've just got to find a quick way to get out of it and keep the thing on track. One of the things I like in that piece is, is the water coming down the trough, which I understand is, that's is real. live action. Yeah, that's and, real. And the perspective in those shots is really quite, um, yeah. it's really quite deep and really nice. Yeah, because film can't lie. You know, I, I looked at whether we could actually do it CGI, but it just looked a bit manufactured. Right. So I thought, well, let's just do the real thing and then, um, then drop the rats in afterwards, you know, put them after. Well, on the note of perspective, let's go to the next piece. The next piece is uh, Vantage Point, which is from 2008 and was directed by Pete Travis. Um, could we roll that clip, please? So this is much more of a, a mood and just a feeling that's evoked from this. Can you explain a little bit about what this represents? Uh, yeah, again, you know, it's out of context unless you've seen the film. But the whole idea is uh, it's uh, seven points of view on an assassination from a sniper. So that was my graphic representation of what that could be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the color too, when you're talking about sort of seamless, seamlessly blending uh, yeah. into the first frame, I mean, this is not like the other ones where you're actually using footage from the film or kind of creating a story that then butts up against the film. Mm. I mean, this is highly graphic and then uh, going right to live action, yet it still seems to have that same yeah. feel and well, that's, that's the magic. I mean, hopefully, if you never see the join, then it works. So. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on to the next one. The next one we've got here is uh, from 2003. It's The Dreamers uh, from Bernardo Bertolucci. Um, can we play this piece, please? So this one, I love, I love the arch architectural motif in this. And interestingly, this is about a, a simple love triangle, mm, is it not? That's right. No quadrangles yeah, here. Yeah. But you've gone for something so architectural. What was the, the decision for that? Um, well, again, you know, look for a classic icon of, of Paris, obvious. So use the obvious. Right, and it's then about just, American in Paris, right? Yeah, and then yeah. just twist it. So I thought, well, if I've got, if I shoot a black and white shot and then bring in the trickler colors and then fade in the colour of the film, and then link it to the character. And that was it. What was it like working with Bertolucci? Scary. <laughs> Why? Because uh, he was a really, really nice, really nice man, quite forceful. Um, but God, does he pack a good lunch? He took me to an amazing lunch. <laughs> and that's scary. That sounds fantastic. That was great then. Yeah. But uh, it was quite a tough deadline, and. Um, Again, he, he kind of left me to my own devices. Once I showed the sort of key idea, he, you know, he just said, yeah, just have a go. I thought, Christ, it better work. <laughs> How did you come to meet him? Did you know him or was this um, a pitch? I knew him through, no, there's no pitch again. Um, I was fortunate to know Jeremy Thomas, who I've known for a long, long time. And uh, Jeremy introduced me to Bernardo. You have a lot of... Uh famous filmmaker friends it seems based on your your list of work um, do you do you like the process of pitching or do you prefer to have a job sort of through a referral um, I think if I really if, if it's if it's new people I understand why they do do the pitch thing um, if it's something I, I can feel that I can really add to it I'll probably have a go as long as it's you know not too ridiculous but I'm not on the whole on for pitching I find that whole process a bit you know it's a bit like, you know, go to a hotel and I'll pay you if I have a comfortable night's sleep. That's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> Ooh, that could be an interesting business model. Yeah. Well, no, but you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> you know, because actually once I give away an idea or part of an idea, you're giving them something, you know? And, mm, scary area, pitching. Do you, ever, do you ever turn down requests for pitch? Yep, absolutely. On what basis? Yep. Um, don't trust them or I think they're looking for free ideas or it can be, you know. You know, when I've spent my whole life, you know, working and creating things, just giving it away just seems a bit, mm, not sure about that. How, how can you tell if someone's just looking at uh, their way? Sixth Sense. 
six cell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's quite a lot of bullshitters in the film industry, I can assure you. No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 can waste you a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, let's go to the next piece. The next piece is Seed of Chucky from 2004, directed by Don Mancini. I have to admit, That's a complete I find change. the inclusion of this piece a little curious. Um, it's probably my own personal bias. I think I, I'm more of a high fidelity kind of girl than a girl uh, Seed of Chucky. Can I can I tell you something? Yes, please. It's one of Tim Burton's favorite as mine. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. All right, before we get there, I mean, uh, what's, uh, what, what, what do you find interesting about this piece? I mean, of all the 130 or more films that uh, you, you've created titles for, you've included this in the reel, I find it curious. What about it is interesting to you? Um, it, it was interesting because I like Don Mancini, the creator. I thought he was a terrific character and uh, he had a very short deadline. And um, part of the process of this whole birth channel thing, he, he said that, you know, would you about pull this off in about three weeks? I said, well, I'll give it a try. So I had a word with the uh, 3D people because I thought, well, I've got to do a lot of this 3D. And uh, they said, well, God, no, Rich, it's a bit, I mean, how are we going to make a birth channel? So I said, Christ, I don't know. So I went down to the local butcher oh, and, and I got... Naturally. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so that's an obvious place to start. Um, and I, I noticed that he was showing me some different cuts of meat and I got a, a section of lamb, I think it was, which he cut for me. And I took the 3D guy down there with me and he said, I'll tell you what, if, we, if you got that and we could scan and shoot that, I reckon we could roll that into a birth channel. So I said, well, there you go then, that's what we're gonna do. And that was the birth channel. So they only had to make the sperm in 3D. And then um, Mancini said to me, he said, Richard, what, what about sperm at the front? Doesn't that happen first? I thought, oh, God, yeah, it does. So I thought, how am I going to do that? So I got a sheet of plate glass, and then we poured paint down to give it the idea of sperm. And for some reason, Tim Burton sort of loves this. Every time he sees me, pokes fun at this. <laughs> so that's why it's included. Oh, my God, that's repulsively yeah. amazing. Yeah. Can we roll it so we can, you know, take our imaginations away yeah. from this? <laughs> Poor old Chucky. <laughs> Completely ridiculous. <laughs> lamb, really, lamb. It's, yeah, it's I, a piece of lamb. Yeah, I will never. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. Never, never look at the uh, yeah. female re reproductive system the same yeah. again. See, it's uh. definitely about time I got a real job. You see, <laughs> I, I just have fun doing what I do. <laughs> God. Um, okay, let's move on. <laughs> let's move uh, on to Batman, 1989, directed by Tim Burton. You talked a little bit about it. Um, I think these titles are seminal. I bet you there's nobody in this room who doesn't have them emblazoned on, our, on their brain. Well, maybe half of us. I think the rest of us are maybe a little too young. Um, but, uh, you know, you, I read somewhere that you said that the way that these titles kind of come in this mm -hmm. slow sort of... Um, reveal of what it is fit in with uh, Tim Burton's own philosophy is that correct yeah kind of yeah it's just it's just this whole thing of getting to Gotham City but just getting there through the brand really and I mean you know in some ways it's it's very kind of retro now when you look at it um, but the, the core idea you know it still holds true this idea of um, discovering a landscape discovering a mark um, you know, back in the day when that, that was done, it had never been, and also the fact that I linked the Warner Brothers logo um, to the to the model was, I think, probably about the first time that was ever done. Which you see all the time now. You see all the time now. I did it once again, I think, on Event Horizon. I did a similar idea, where I linked the Paramount logo to the for, you know to the to my sequence, um, and you know, again, this is. You know, when you look at this now, I mean, that's analog, remember? You know, this is stop frame animation. This is staying up all night with car filler, rubbing down the sides of the model. Two models, 15 foot and eight foot models. Um, everybody from Warner Brothers really paranoid about what I was doing. So it's quite a lot of pressure there because it's the first time of a, of a big blockbuster coming out. You know, you have to kind of understand the what was going down at the time as much as anything else. And I remember when I shot this, Tim said, well, as soon as you finish, they're gonna come, security people are gonna come and whip that model away. You know, nobody is to see anything of what you've done. So it was all a little bit MI5, you know, CIA going on, um, with the pressure of having to do this thing and would it work? Um, it took me, I think, 
four or five days with the model makers to shoot it. Um, and again, it was, uh, which you may, may or might know, it was, there was also a 70 mil print made. So the detail, you can imagine the actual detail that I had to get on that thing. Um, but car filler seemed to work really well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, roll that clip. Well, I'm sure you know it. There you go. How big was that model? Uh, two, there's two sections there. It's a 15 foot and about eight foot. So the whole logo, where you see the where you saw that mix, that's the obviously the smaller one. And then I'm shooting channels in these big 15 foot sections because you know it's all about scale. Um, obviously today you wouldn't make it like that. That'd all be made in CGI now. Um, the, the other proud thing I've got with that connected to that job is um, there was no sense of what the music was going to be when I made it. And Tim said, don't worry, because we've got the London Symphony Orchestra. When you finished it, <clears throat> you can come with me and we'll go up to what was then Wembley. And the whole orchestra was there and they recorded what they just played to what they saw. So they scored, Danny Elfman, they just scored to what the, the images were. Wow. That was amazing seeing that. That was incredible. I mean, it yeah. took a few takes, but <laughs> the fact that they were actually scoring it by looking at what I'd shot, you know, in the in then days, you know, the edited version of it. That was terrific. Mm -hmm. That's happened a few times. When I work with um, a French director, Jean-Jacques Arnoux, he does the same process. He likes me to work without any sense of sound. And then again, he always gets a massive, great orchestra up to Abbey Road, and then away they go. And that's a great moment for me. It's terrific. I love that. OK, let's move to the next piece. It's from 2004. It's called Creep, uh, from a director called Christopher Smith. Um, I've not heard of this film myself mm, yeah cult film um, we had no money to do it literally no money but I liked the director and I liked the script and as it turned out I was really pleased that I did do it and uh, it certainly lives up to the film's title I think this is a pretty creepy kind mm. of uh, uh, sequence uh, what was the intent with this piece uh, the intent with this is um, it's you'll see from the graphic style that I'm using I wanted to get the audience to feel as though they were already in the underground without showing a train so I, I just got big big pieces of lettering and scratched them all up and then got a 5k light and then shot the light behind them so it gave the idea of, of a train trains lights you know windows but without seeing a train was the idea and then mix that in with some DVD footage that we shot of some gruesomeness. Okay, let's roll that. <laughs> So again, you can see there, it was my decision to, again, with the help of the producers, to move the logo. I, I insisted that the logo had to be at the end so that I ended up with the underground pastiche circle, which links the circle of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So the next one we have is uh, The Constant Gardener from 2005. It was directed by Fernando Morales. Mor Please tell me. <laughs> I've got myself now. Marillis. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I don't know why. It's City one of those of God. words. Uh, who directed City of God. Um, who, his films are wonderfully beautiful and evocative and very visual. Um, what was it like working with him and, and what were you trying to do with these titles? Um, yeah, I'd never met him before, obviously, until this time. And I had long discussions with him about City of God to, so I'd kind of understand how he, how he was and how he worked. And he, he comes across, he's very calm, very understated sort of chap. And he's, he's really, I, what I think really, he's more of a documentary maker. I mean, that City of God took him two years to make that. I mean, that's a hell of a feat. Um, but he's, yeah, he's very calm, very placid, not what I imagined he would be. Um, and it was really nice to meet him and spend some time with him. And again, you know, I, I kind of put my suggestions forward that we should really put everything on the end because I think the end of the film is quite dramatic and let it go out very slowly and use those African colours to, to kind of like take you away from it all. Um, and it was, you know, quite simple and a very nice experience to work with him. So why don't we show that? And so on. 
So was those were these sequences? Were they already shot, or did you get yeah, an opportunity the, to shoot yeah, them? Yeah, the I think you can see there from the idea. What I wanted to do is to reveal the. Um, I picked up on the roofs, the lovely corrugated roofs, and I, and I said to him that, why don't we take those, bring them through really slowly, and then take some of your footage, which I can cut together, and then look, make it look as though it's projected onto onto rusty metal, beautiful colours, and that's what we did. Great. Okay, we've got one more piece before we can get to some questions. Um, this one is called This Year's Love. It's from 1999, directed by David Kane. Um, why don't we just roll this and talk about it? I find this one both intimate and abstract at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the story with this one? Um, well, you can see from the opening shot, the, it's an art house film. And again, I like, I like the script and I like the whole idea of it, but they're tattoo artists anyway, so I thought, oh, that's obvious then. <laughs> um, which wasn't to the, to the people that made the film. So I said, look, I'll get my own um, actors, models, and see if I can actually shoot a sequence that would you know, tie in. And there it is, really. I'm assuming someone didn't actually have, have to get this year's love tattooed on them. Uh, I did that as a transfer. <laughs> <laughs> but all, all the rest are real tattoos. And, um, or doing, else you'd have to pay for a lot of laser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. But also, this was, what year was this I did this? 99. 99. Um, back then, I was not that familiar with tattoos as we are today. So you have to remember back then, it, they weren't like everywhere, like they are in London now, and I'm sure probably here as well. Um, so the casting was quite eventful, I can assure you. <laughs> I could not believe that people were completely covered in tattoos until I started the casting. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway, it's good fun. Uh, so we're going to uh, open it up to questions, but what I'd like to ask everyone's cooperation with is we have a couple of people with microphones. So either if you have a microphone in your hand, that means you can pretty much talk, or if I will direct the microphone to somebody just so that we can get it captured on tape. So um, does anybody have a question or a microphone? We need a microphone here. There's a lady here. I was just wondering, at what point do you get involved in the sound design? Does it lead any of your designs and thinking, or does one follow the other? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a good, good question, because we're not touched on that this morning. And um, what tends to happen there is I like to work completely without any sound. Um, let, let the images happen first, because what I tend to find with, um, and, and directors tend to agree with me on this, until composers see an image, it's quite abstract for them to actually interpret what the sound you know, should evolve, how it should be. And it's the same on the film, really. Until something's shot, it's very hard to kind of score something. So what I'll tend to do is I'll make what I call a, a kind of rough edit. So once we've gone past legals, creative, <clears throat> I'll make an animatic or a rough cut, just something so they've got something visual to a time that they can get onto, and then it's just a matter of then them and I kind of working very closely together until we come up to the final kind of mix, really. And you know, it seems to work, you know, effortlessly, really. But it's very hard to do it the other way around. I mean, sometimes somebody said, "Oh, we really want to put this track on the front," and I said, "Yeah, but you don't know what's going to be on the front." Oh no, but we really like this track. And then I do some images. Oh yeah, that doesn't track work now, does it? Said, no, well because you know it's carp for the horse, really. Um, you know, even with um, working with Bernardo Bertolucci, you know, he, we, he hadn't chosen that Hendrix track. You know, with that came out of discussions, you know, what should it be after I'd come up with the idea? So I kind of muted, well, it'd be great to have something from that era. And he said, oh, well, we could get the rights, or Jeremy said we could get the rights to use that Hendrix track. I said, yeah, let's have that, you know, and that'll work. Um, so it's kind of organic process again, really. But it's a good question. I'm sure it happened that easily too. Let's just get Hendrix. Oh sure. yeah, as long as I don't have to write the check. <laughs> right here. Yeah, I just had a question about um, <clears throat> kind of you were saying uh, people stealing your ideas. You didn't like pitching for that reason. Um, what I want to know is, you know, if you see something that seems derivative of your work, uh, do you feel like, oh well, it's fine. I'm an endless well of creativity, or does that really, uh, you know, get you get you? 
angry. Oh, sorry. What? Well, if I see something that somebody's copied from what I've done? Yeah. No, I'm not bothered by that. That's great. I love that. That's fine. But what if it's something that you pitched but you didn't get the job? Uh, so, uh, oh, somebody got caught out with that once. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very hard. That's another reason I just don't like doing it because unless you really trust the people, you know, who knows what they're doing with those ideas. Um, who was it? Picasso, wasn't it? That story where he quickly, he was drawing something and this guy came up and said, oh, how much do you want for that? I can't remember exactly the story. But he said, oh, I don't know. $300 and the guy said well it only took you five minutes to do that he said yeah but it's taken me you know 20 years to be able to do that in that time do, do you know what I mean you have to there comes a point you have to put a value on what you're doing you know because a lot of people say oh Rich it comes really easy to you it's not a really job is it well it's come easy because I've been doing it a long time you know it's it, it looks simple that's the idea but to get there that's a lot of work but for you, you have obviously have three decades behind you and you kind of, it just comes naturally and you've got a rapport with people where you're just like, T don't steal my idea. Um, to somebody who might be starting out and doesn't have the same sort of uh, sense of uh, assuredness or cajones, I guess, to sort of, you know, take, take people to task on that. I mean, what do you say to people who are younger who are not oh, in a position, out. not in a position to say, no, I'm not going to pitch. Oh no! But then well, their ideas get taken. Like that's I mean, a pretty yeah, tough no, I'm situation. With you. I, I mean, I don't think that's a conversation for here because it wastes too much time. But yeah, you, 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 you unfortunately, you guys or, or ladies, you don't have a choice. You know, if you if you need to make a start now, nine times out of ten, it's going to be a pitch. Um, all I can say is just try and do your homework as closely as you can. Um, make sure you do things like copyright your work. That's really important. So many students I've spoken to do not copyright their work. Oh, can we do that, Richard? Yeah, of course you can do that. Put a C in a circle and write copyright Jack Smith, or whatever your name is, and make sure it's on all those boards. It, it, they can get round that, obviously, but it will make them double think. It will make them think, oh, hang on, maybe these young guys and girls are not that naive once they spot that copyright sign. So there's little things that you can do. Find out how many people you're pitching against. Don't feel shy. You know, if you think, oh great, I've been asked to do this work. This is really fantastic. Yeah, that's good. But then ask them a question. Don't feel frightened. Say to them, oh, I'm really pleased to be pitching on this project uh, for you. Um, how many other people are pitching? If they say 20, walk away. If they say between three and five, not bad. That means they could be trusted. Have a go. You know, you, you've got to, you know, try and Try and always swing it back onto them when, whenever you can. But, you know, it's a big discussion, that whole pitch thing. I mean, I still have to do it occasionally, but, you know, I, I would judge it rather than just jump into it. Another question? Hi. I was just curious if you've ever watched a movie opening and been bothered by it and thought you could have done a better job uh, if so, what movie, and what would you have done differently? Ooh. Yeah, I've seen a few disasters in my time. I'm sure we all have. <laughs> um, I don't know, really. I just kind of let it wash over me. I don't really get too caught up with other people's work. or Because I understand that there may be a good reason why something looks really awful at the front of a film. Or even the film itself is awful, you know. <laughs> there, there, there are so many combinations in filmmaking. Um, you know, unless you can actually look behind the thing, you, on face value, it's very hard to know. What There's a hell of a lot of politics involved. What, what do you think makes a good title, or what do you like least like to see? Are there any bad habits that you see and just go... Uh, copying. I don't like copying. I know, I know it's a few people I'm not going to mention. I keep noticing they do the same thing all the time. They're just a different spin on the same thing. And that's a bit infuriating. Because as I said to you earlier, you know, each film script is completely unique and should be taken as on that basis. You know, you should dismiss anything you've done previous and take every job, you know, fresh, which hopefully I've showed you today. There's no one job there that's alike. We have one here in the middle. Thanks so much for showing us your work. I wanted to ask you about your choice of typography. 
the uh -huh. typefaces that you choose and the way that you set it? Uh, yeah, typography um, is a kind of very, obviously, a very strong element. And what I tend to do now more is um, w once I've got the imagery, once I've got the style, the flow of what the piece is going to be, I tend to find that the typography almost slots in. It, it kind of recognizes what everything else is about and then uh, then gets on there. Um, a lot of the times we'll we'd still do stuff by hand. Um, you know, there's my main assistant is a, a real specialist in typography, much better than I am. And he, he will probably hand draw something or we'll look at different ways that the logo could be and we'll adapt it. And you know, we, we, you know, we love typography, but it's more his area now more than mine. I let him, you know, be in control of that because he's just so much more of a specialist now. You know, I'm fine with Helvetica and Gil Sands and Times and Garamond <laughs> and all the rest of it. Once we start messing around, it, you know, I have to leave it to, you know, specialists. Specialists are key in our industry, in, you know, in filmmaking. Everybody anything? adds. We have one over here. Hi, um, I'm just curious about the turn turnaround schedule. Like, what what process in the film do you come in as like the title director, and like how much like process and like, how much time the schedule? Uh, that you okay. Have? Um, again, every job is different. I mean, I'm just now starting work with um, David Mamet on the Phil Spector for HBO, and I've got loads of lead in time on that. I mean, I don't have to deliver till. January, February, and I'm already well underway with, with you know, how we're going to um, adapt the piece and, and work with David Mamet on that. Other jobs, <clears throat> um, like, you know, that Cedar Chucky thing, I mean, we had three weeks to do that, start to finish. I literally had to go to sleep, wake up with the idea and get on with it. You know, otherwise it would never would have happened. Um, they do vary. Um, Another one I'm working on now, again, like I mentioned earlier, working with Stephen, that tends to be a much more drawn out process because you know he's so character driven, so narrative driven in, in the way he does the scripts and, and the way he shoots stuff. He likes to think and ponder for days and days and days. So I drop the thing down, wait a week, pick it up again, and try and be on the same page as him where he is psychologically with it, and then move on again. You know, so they're all different, but that's what makes it fun and challenging as well. That's the fun of it. I think we have time for one more question up here. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about um, creative people that have inspired you over the years, whether it be designers, um, authors, or musicians. Uh, yeah, my favorite musician is um, probably John Coltrane or Miles Davis. I mean, they're, they're kind of stuff that I listened to since about the age of 13 and still listen to it. Um, uh, Saul Bass has been a massive influence on me and still is. Um, I probably wouldn't be doing it now if it wasn't for uh, Morris Binder, so that'd be another one. Um, God, books, I don't know, endless great authors that you know I really love. Um, I always immerse myself in all that all the time constantly so inspiration I think is really important to all of us you know find inspiration wherever you can you've obviously um, done a lot of work over the years and and you're likely an inspiration to many people who are starting out in this industry of your own work when you look back do you have a, a particular emotional connection to any pieces that you've done do you have any favorites and if so why um, no that's been asked of me before and, and quite honestly they, I love them and hate some of them all for different reasons they they've all all been a challenge and they've all been interesting some have been hits some haven't you know because the film's bombs because when you're doing a film you never know if it's going to be a hit or not when you're working on it everybody thinks it's going to be a hit and then suddenly it doesn't you know whatever so I, I tend to kind of just wait for the next project and don't get too caught up with with past work you know so I don't really have a favorite because as I keep saying is that, although on the face of it, you know, I don't know, something like Sweeney Todd looks, looks amazing and I do really like that and everybody that, that helped me achieve that and it's a lovely piece of work, but it's past, I'm on to the next thing. 
and you know it's it's all those moments which 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 will make a piece and they're all quite sort of personal they're quite different it's mm -hmm. it's good not to be attached i find as a creative i i like to just keep moving on let's get the next challenge going you know and obviously the great thing which i've obviously learned over the years is that you know with technology because of you know we've gone from film to vhs to dvd to download to cloud um the great thing is that these pieces of work unlike commercials or tv um they keep alive somehow you know another generation can then then find them which is which is great you know so they they're almost becoming in a a weird way kind of art form mm -hmm. you know the more that time goes on it's quite interesting how they have they don't sort of drop off there's always a long seems to be a long tail you know which great commercials i've seen over the years you know it's hard to then find them again you know like the classic sort of guinness commercials or or whatever classic commercials you you out there like you know it's it's interesting this whole film thing it does keep living and it never sort of goes which is great really do you Brilliant. have do you have as a parting shot do you have one piece of advice for people who uh work in the world of of branding and and titles and design a uh, moving image um yeah just try and get started if if you're not started just get started wherever you can i mean a good place to start is to start right close to yourself you know with friends you know with bands anything that you're familiar with is always a really good place to start you know i started with a scooter and a set of pencils and a pad you know that that's how i started and i don't think that's a lot different now you know there's there's this great idea now with the internet you've got to look miles away you know to to find a job or to find something actually it can be really really quite close to you and i think if you're starting out and again because you know equipment is so cheap you know get a group of you together you know find something that you've got a passion for and just do it you know just get on with it you know because the time is moving so fast now as you all know things are switching around so quick <clears throat> so be kind of much more oh what's near me what can i get to really quickly and maybe that's that's the way to start don't try and bite off big chunks you know because you know if you're going to be in in our sort of business in whatever role you know, as I found out, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. If you want to be in it long term, it doesn't happen quickly. It's keep at it. Great. So I need to keep at it now. Get back <laughs> to it. Well, thank you so much for your time and it's your insight pleasure. and sharing your work with I us. I hope that helps you all. <laughs>